A mercy flight brings aid to starving refugees from another bloody civil war in Africa. But to the cynical and the unscrupulous, the aid flights provide camouflage for a more deadly trade. You can have the classic incidents where an aircraft will carry many tons of munitions to a destination and then shortly afterwards be carrying relief goods and bandages. My name is Roger Cook from Central Television. Yeah. I'd like to talk to you about your arms shipping business. We investigate the war brokers who see the suffering of others simply as a business opportunity for themselves. The load was obviously munitions of war. We have never seen a totally effective arms embargo anywhere in the world ever. They feed like vultures on the blood of the innocent African children. The reality is that there are merchants of death at work. This is Rwanda, right up by the border with Zaire and the town of Goma. Through Goma airstrip down there and back across that border came the arms and the ammunition to murder more than a million people. Tonight we expose a British-based businessman who in defiance of international law and in pursuit of pure profit runs arms to Rwanda and to both sides in many of the world's trouble spots. And behind that man, an unscrupulous government-owned company prepared to flout the United Nations arms ban and keep the weapons streaming in. A funeral in Butari, in southern Rwanda. The dead man was the provincial governor, assassinated in a bid to destabilize the regime. He's just one statistic among the million or more people killed in the last two years in the biggest act of genocide since the Second World War. Much of this carnage was made possible by arms racketeers <coughs> operating thousands of miles away from the killing fields of Africa. Newmarket, center of Britain's horse racing and bloodstock industries and center also for an altogether bloodier business. From these officers, a broker arranges the planes, the pilots, and the paperwork needed for the clandestine arms trade. Much of the time, he's acted with the Bulgarian state-owned arms company, Kintex. Our investigations show they are responsible for the large-scale supply of arms to many parts of the world. But will they sell arms illegally? We send in an undercover reporter, complete with secret camera. He's posing as an arms buyer. Hello. Good morning. I have an appointment with Mr. Galabov. 6,000 miles away, Rwanda is a pinprick on the map of Africa. About the size of Wales with 6 million inhabitants, it grows tea and coffee and should be one of the most tranquil places on Earth. But for two years, it's been racked by a civil war between the minority Tutsis, who now largely make up the government, and the rival majority Hutu faction. Nobody will publicly admit to paying the hard cash needed to keep up the flood of weapons, but exiled Hutu leaders boast that a major Western European power is backing them. Certainly the chance to make a fast franc exists when contracts to export cheap coffee, tea and valuable minerals will go to the powers that back the winning side in this war. One of the madnesses about the society in which we're living is that we are still spending as a human species more than 250 times as much as we, on arms as we spend on peacekeeping and we're only spending a fraction of what we spend on peacekeeping on conflict resolution and preemptive diplomacy. If uh, a mission came from some other galaxy, how on earth would it give a rational explanation of human behavior on return to base? In the Rwandan capital, Kigali, the government braces itself for another round of the war. Survivors of the genocide blame the United Nations for not doing enough to protect them or to prevent the massive rearming they see going on near their country's borders. Exiled Hutu soldiers are massing on Rwanda's borders. 
In countries like Burundi, they're being trained and rearmed with weapons smuggled in through Zaire and its airfield at Goma. We arrived at Goma earlyish in the morning, about 9, 10 o'clock. It was pretty obvious what the cargo was once the boxes came out. The load was obviously munitions of war. This pilot has flown from Bulgaria into Goma and elsewhere with arms and medical supplies for both sides. It might appear ironic that a company would carry both munitions and then bandages to a destination, um, but perhaps in a rather cutthroat world, that is how a lot of these operators, when they do have financial difficulties, manage to continue to survive. One of those who has survived is Willem Oendijk, a Dutchman who owns this air freight business in Newmarket. His office appears innocuous, the cargoes he arranges are not. He organized the flight that brought these weapons to Goma in February. It was a mixed bag designed for use in training new recruits. They were supplied to the rebel Hutu soldiers and taken to their arsenal, where we secretly filmed them days later. These sheets detail gun-running flights into Zaire, organized by Owen Dyke, using three companies, Vital Link, Overnight Aviation of Nigeria, where he was once a senior manager, and EAS in Belgium. Everything would point to the fact that uh, Willem's main business is in the exportation and organization of munitions to various parts of the world. Owen Dyke's immoral activities are not confined to black Africa. According to the paperwork, this plane was carrying innocent-sounding electrical equipment. In fact, it contained rocket launchers bound for Ecuador. It was turned back by customs in the Azores. I think that aircraft was actually undercutting us because we were offered some flights like that and then we didn't get them. The next thing we heard, this Russian aircraft was doing it and it had been stopped. Sport Martin flew supplies for the Gulf War allies and to the Falklands. He knew just what that cargo would be. It would be military equipment. These flights are arranged, they, they pay well. Uh, I think, I think the Russian aircraft did it. He had three different manifests. He got electrical equipment, something else, and something else. Some aircraft were going to the Peruvian side, some were going to the Ecuadorian side. It is unusual for any of these type of flights to originate from the United Kingdom. Uh, in general terms, they will operate from an Eastern Bloc country the Eastern Bloc country most likely to be involved is Bulgaria. In the capital, Sofia, our undercover arms buyer is trying to get firm proof that the Bulgarians will ignore the United Nations ban on the export of arms to Rwanda. Our man is met by the head of the small arms section, Kirill Galabov, and Steko Stekov of their export department. Galabov introduces the company. Please to represent our company as a main supplier of military equipment. Kintex is a shareholding company, 100% owned by our government. And our commercial enterprise is specialized in dealing with military equipment. That means bomb Mr. Galabov is prepared to offer us everything from bullets to guided missiles, as long as we can pay for it and as long as the currency is dollars. So this is in general our fields for trading. Our cover story is supported by documents and faxes prepared with the help of the Rwandan government. They too want to expose the Bulgarians' illegal double dealing. Since the Second World War, more than 30 million people have been killed. There are 34 conflicts raging in the world at the moment now in which small arms are central to them. In the Second World War, of the war-related casualties, something like 50% were civilians. In those 34 wars going on at the moment, more than 90% are civilians. 
Lord Judd, former defence minister, director of Oxfam, and now of the arms pressure group, Safer World. But the question that came across to me as I talked to people about their horrendous experiences, children being chopped to death in front of them, their villages being burnt to the ground, was what's behind this? How do we stop this? And of course the arms trade is central to the whole issue. Back in Bulgaria, we present our credentials and our order. We clearly state that the arms are for Rwanda and that there is an arms embargo in force. Obviously, there is water concerning especially Rwanda. Yeah, this, this is obviously a difficulty. I think it's okay. There is no any restriction for this region, so I cannot see any problem. No problem, perhaps, for Mr. Golabov, but escalating problems for these children, now undergoing dance therapy in a Rwandan orphanage. They are just a few of the 800,000 children orphaned or displaced by the war. Seth Sendashonga, Rwanda's interior minister, blames the arms suppliers. When a government allows arms which are destined to, for a regime that kills and that intends to kill at large scale, uh, then definitely there's something wrong on the part of uh, the trader himself who trades in those arms and uh, on the part of the government of that country which allows those arms to be uh, supplied to governments or to groups which are known to be intending to use them to kill. The trouble is, I think, with companies like Kintex, and they're not alone, uh, former Eastern Bloc countries or Far Eastern manufacturers, they want the benefits of the old Cold War secrecy, but they also want to, to generate the hard currency. So in effect, they're, they're try, they are playing the, the post-war game, but playing it by the Cold War rules. And if you're going to get into, into the arms export business, you've got to be honest, you've got to be upfront. When would I probably hear from you? Now it's Friday, same on Monday, you will have our answer. Great. True to their word, the Kintex sanction-busting offer arrives via fax. $182,000 worth of rifles and ammunition, plus another $100,000 for delivery. The price extracted from the Rwandans is infinitely greater. Jafat Nilin Kindi's family was wiped out in a massacre here near Siangugu when the village was razed to the ground. My mother, my brother, my, you know, my nephews, they were all killed. And uh, even I don't know where they are, if they were buried uh, or if they were just eaten by dogs. That also I don't know. This is my brother's wife, and she is the only one who lived here, left. I'm not furious, I'm not mad. The only thing is that I'm sad because I don't understand how, you know, those things happened. Kenneth Barham is bishop of the area in which Jaffet's family was murdered. His diocese witnessed some of the worst incidents during the genocide. Doctors killed other doctors. Nurses killed other doctors. I mean, it's, it's quite unbelievable, the sort of uh, tragedy that, that we heard about there. Since last uh, April, there is nobody to occupy those things. It is empty, and I don't know if there will be anybody else because all the family was almost exterminated. I'm the only one left. The church definitely feels that anything can be done to stop arms coming in, particularly to the entire Hamwe, uh, who've already caused such terrible suffering, should be stopped. If you are a businessman, you have to make money, I do understand, but not just make money on uh, a lot of, you know, body dead of people. I believe that these men knew for what those arms they were sold for. So for me, he is a killer like others. While Jaffet ponders the past, those who survived the first onslaught wander hopelessly looking for security. Amnesty International fears that continued international apathy will inevitably lead to more slaughter. People were selling arms to those who are responsible for this genocide are irresponsible. They are 
driven by greed and they feed like vultures on the blood of the innocent African children that are being massacred by people who have planned this genocide, who have drawn up lists of people to be killed, who have trained the militias, who have imported the arms. Those people have not been brought to justice. And today, they are planning and they are importing arms again that will allow tomorrow these militia to commit the same atrocities as the one that they had committed last year. In New York, the United Nations is just as loud in its condemnation of sanctions-busting arms dealers and rather more forthright than is usual for diplomats. What do you think of people who make a living, as some of these arms dealers do, out of playing both ends against the middle? Well, I think it is criminal. What they are doing is uh, uh, trading in uh, instruments of killing and murder, of terrorizing, and uh, that cannot be condoned. The situation on the ground is extremely worrying in Rwanda, in Burundi, and in the neighboring uh, countries where uh, we have seen uh, over the past several months, uh, we've seen uh, uh, military training, uh, we've seen the inflow of arms into the uh, region, and we have seen uh, increasingly incursions. The international funds for the uh, provision of uh, food and other relief items is seemingly having a harder time getting financed than the arms flows. You say you're having trouble keeping the food and aid pipeline going, yet the arms dealers appear to be operating at will. Well, an arms embargo can uh, put some uh, deterrence uh, to some extent, but uh, it certainly cannot stop it. We have never seen a totally effective arms embargo anywhere in the world ever. Labour's foreign affairs spokesman Robin Cook visited Rwanda earlier this year. He blames the failure of the arms embargo on the members of the United Nations themselves. Of course, it could be 100% effective if every member state of the United Nations actually did observe it. In the case of Britain, what action can it take against people who appear to be implicated in the supply of arms? In the case, perhaps, of other member states of the UN, are they putting up the money to pay for these arms? Now, if the member states, some of them perhaps in the Security Council of the UN, did enforce the embargo, then they would be 100% effective. But it is not effective. These weapons were captured from soldiers who were part of a Hutu hit squad. They were specially trained in Zaire and equipped with mines, grenades and Kalashnikovs smuggled in through Goma. As the tools of an assassination squad, you've got everything you want here. You've got the long range with your grenades, you've got your hand-thrown grenades, you've got the magazines for your weapons for personal protection, and the anti-personnel mines, you can either cover your exit by laying the minefield forward of you before you throw your grenades in, or simply leave them in the likely routes that you may be followed. Uh, it's an old tactic from Africa from way back when. We were trained to lay landmines and operate undercover as civilians. Our orders were to generate a sense of insecurity in Rwanda. We had new weapons just for this operation, and our orders were to restart the war. If I was the Rwandan government, I would be genuinely very worried by that. It's good equipment, it's reliable, uh, it's proven all of that equipment has been used in previous campaigns and operations by different armies around the world. It is, yes, it, it, it's genuinely worrying stuff. These are a pitiful few of the more than two million people displaced as this beautiful country has been torn apart. One of the less obvious problems with refugees like these is that nobody really knows which side their sympathies lie. Amongst them could be hidden war criminals or leaders of future conflict. And intelligence sources report that with outside help, opposition forces are regrouping, retraining and re-equipping in the hope of reinvading this country with help from the enemy within. We obtained information on the location of several Hutu training camps. With our coordinates, US spy satellites pinpointed them in neighboring states. What has happened in Rwanda in 1994 matters to all of us because of the scale of the massacres. One million people were killed in four months, that is, 
8,000 people being killed every day in a country the size of Wales. Aware of this, stretched United Nations and Rwandan government troops try to dam the flood of arms. Occasionally they succeed, as they did here in Zaire. But Pierre Sane insists they need more outside help. We call on those governments to investigate and to make sure that the transfer of arms to the perpetrators of the genocide will not lead to further killing. We will hold them accountable. But that's easier said than done. A loadmaster recalls a chilling conversation he overheard on an arms flight to Goma. The two gentlemen who appeared to be in control and the minister were openly talking about selling of munitions of war, openly talking about, oh yes, I can get you rocket launchers, I can get you anti-tank weapons, I can get you tanks. But as the conversation went on and the way the loading was going on, it became pretty clear it was covert and it was three or four chartered people involved with buying and selling through dummy companies or whatever to avoid the necessary licenses. This was yet another load arranged through Willem Oendijk in Newmarket. Time to pay him a visit. Mr. Oendijk. My name is Roger Cook from Central Television. Yeah. I'd like to talk to you about your arms shipping business. Well, I can't long Mr. Cook. I don't do any arms shipping. Yes, you not, do. Not, not illegal ones. You do do illegal no, ones. No, I do not. Sorry. You have shipped arms which have been responsible for I have not genocide done. in Rwanda. Uh, you have shipped say. arms in contravention of United Nations... ..in contravention of United Nations law. Although he does admit to gun running, Owen Dyke locks himself away, refusing to look at our evidence or answer accusations about illegal activities. So we call at the Bulgarian embassy. The Bulgarians, after all, own one of Owen Dyke's major suppliers. It's left to the ambassador to examine the documents and faxes that have passed between us and Kintex. He appears unconvinced. These are again faxes and, you know, it's, um... Well, they're in the names of all the right people you'll see from Kintex. Okay. Yes, but, you know, but those names are not a secret. Uh, uh, the telephone numbers and the fax numbers of the Kintex are not a secret. It's a company. So, so well, either it's it, genuine it or, be, or, Mr. It, Ambassador, either I it's genuine or you are telling us we fabricated it. It, it, may, it may be. It may be. I, I, I don't know. So, in, in principle, we cannot see any problem to do this. So, when somebody makes an offer like this, that's okay, is it? No. Uh, yes, it's, you, you can make any offer, of course. Yes, you're free to make any offer. I, I'm, and even, you know, I, I must say, honestly, that uh, um, when, when you say uh, Rwanda, it's not, it doesn't occur to your mind immediately that in, it's an embargo country. These so, negotiations, uh, Ambassador, went on for 10 days. There's plenty of time for people to look it up, if they were serious I, about it. I can't it. comment on things I have not, uh, um, uh, I have not been informed. I can only, you know, speculate and uh, suppose. Uh, but, uh, again, I, I must say that uh, uh, an export license uh, wouldn't be delivered in this case, of course. I can very firmly say. Uh, say that. Will you be taking this matter up with Kintex? I will inform my ministry, of course, and my, my, uh, my government about, uh, about this, and uh, uh, that's it. And they will check, and we have the procedures needed, but it, it takes some time. The most precious bad thing that we all own is our own life, and uh, therefore, if anybody does not adhere to that simple principle and uh, supplying him with arms to commit suppression of human life as it has been in Rwanda is certainly a crime. <laughs>